Hi everyone, just starting a new series. So in this series I'm going to be reading you a book. I'm going to be reading you a different chapter every day. Some days I'll be using it to set you some tasks to do for your English work. Sometimes I'm just going to read it to you. I thought seeing as we can't do guide reading at the moment, it'd be nice for you to hear a book. You can listen to it. I'll read you one chapter at a time. See what you think. This book's called The Middler. I found it on a review website and they said it was perfect for year six. So let's have a look at the blurb. The blurb. In the town of Fenniswick, there are two rules. Eldists go to military camp when they turn 14, and you don't talk to wanderers. They're dirty, dangerous, and deceitful, or so Maggie's been told. Maggie is a middler, a middle child, and she's sick of it. Eldest children get all the good stuff, the parties, the prizes, and the praise, while middlers grow up in the eldest shadows. Maggie desperately wants a taste of being an eldest, but the summer, but that... The summer that her eldest brother, Jed, goes off to camp and Maggie meets a wanderer, everything she thought she understood about the world comes crashing down. Maggie's just a middler though, so who's going to listen when she tries to tell the truth? Maybe if Maggie can catch the wanderer, the townspeople will see that middlers can be heroes too. Okay everyone, so I'm going to be starting to read chapter one. This is a really exciting sounding book, I think it's going to be quite gripping. I apologise if I make some mistakes, it is live reading. So it will be what it will be. Okay, let's get started. Prologue. Our eldest, Jed, got born first out of all of us. Our youngest, Trig, he got born four years later. And me, Maggie, I was born in between. The middler. Worse luck. Monday, 1st of September. Chapter 1. I took my summer diary out of my drawer. Nearly all the sheets of paper matched. On the very last page I'd drawn a picture of a red admiral. It had black wings and bright red stripes, just like the ones we'd seen up at the butterfly fields. I straightened the yellow wool bow that held it all together and ran my hands over the front to flatten it down. I wouldn't win best diary, an eldest always wins that, but maybe I could get runner up. I carried it downstairs. You ready, Mags? Trig had the front door open and was leaning right out of it, both hands gripping the door frame. His diary was on the doormat, tied up with a garden string. We should have left already, shouldn't we, Dad? We should have left. Oh, Maggie. Dad shook his head with, at my legs. We really need to do something about that uniform. It's even shorter than it was before the holidays. He yanked at the bottom of my dress. It shrugged back up again. Jed, Jed, Jed. Trig was turning red with all his shouting. Just a minute. Jed's voice echoed down the stairs. Mum came out of the kitchen, booted up for a day in the fields. Leave without him, she said. It's his own fault if he's late. Come on, Maggie. Trigg picked up his diary, but I wasn't going anywhere till Jed was with us. Eventually he appeared, shirt hanging out and jam on his chin. Did you remember your summer diary? said Trigg. It's in here. Jed turned around and patted his back pocket. His messy, folded pages flapped out of the top. Dad went to wipe the jam off Jed's face, but he ducked under his arm and we all ran through the door into the warm September air. Trig was hopeless at running. He held his diary right out in front of him all the way to school. Me and Jed had to stop at every corner for him to catch up. Good morning, Mrs Zimmerman. Good morning, Mr Temple. Good morning, Miss Conte. Good morning, Mr Webster. Good morning, everyone. The school had smelled like the beginning of term. Wood oil and scouring powder. Smells weird, doesn't it, Maggie? Doesn't it, Jed? Smells weird. Tree fidgeted and scrunched up his nose. Shh, I said. Linda Tr Lindy Chowdhury was in front of us, all cross-legged and straight-backed and long-haired. Her dress had a new frill sewn round the hem. Jed scooted forward so he was sitting closer to her. Mrs Zimmerman clasped her hands together in front of her waist. Mr Webster has kindly spent part of his summer sanding and oiling our hall floor. Aren't we lucky? I spread out my fingers and pressed my palms on the smooth wood. It must have taken him ages. Heads down, please, for the morning chant. Our eldests are heroes. Our eldests are special. Our eldests are brave. Shame upon any who hold back an eldest, and shame upon their kin. Most of all, shame upon the wanderers. Let peace settle over the quiet war, truthfully, truly and forever. Mrs Zimmerman lifted her head, tilted it to one side and smiled. Welcome back to Fenniswick School, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break. 
We bit at our nails and gazed up at the empty walls while she said all the things that the head teachers have to say at the beginning of term. As well as sanding the floorboards, Mr Webster has also dug over the toilets for us. Please be sure to use the new ones and leave the old ones to compost. He's left everything very clearly signposted. We clapped for Mr Webster. Miss Conte has returned to us after having her little her baby, a little boy called Michael, an eldest. We're hoping his dad might pop in with him one lunchtime. We clapped for Miss Conte. Two of our pupils, Sally Owens and Deb Marino, both eldests, of course, turned 14 over the summer and have gone to camp. We clapped for Sally Owens. We clapped for Deb Marino. And two more of our eldests are heading off to camp this very Saturday. Jed Cruz and Lindy Chowdhury. Jed leaned in and nudged shoulders with Lindy. My hands were getting fed up with all the clapping. And just before we return to our classes, we have a special guest here today with some important news. Mrs Zimmerman held out an arm towards the entrance of the hall. No one came out. Er, uh, we have a special guest here with some important news, she said again, louder this time. No one came out. Mr Temple cleared his throat. He nodded towards the window. Mayor Anderson was sitting on the wall of the Littlest's outdoor play area, feet resting on a go-fast cart and two hands cupped around an enormous putty. Cheese, by the look of it. She finished up chewing, swallowed her mouthful and gave us a wave. A few of us waved back. Mrs Zimmerman took a deep breath in. Would you be so kind as to let the mayor know we're ready for her, Mr Temple? OK. Mayor Anderson stood in the middle of Mrs. Mr Webster's newly oiled floor, her hair drawn back in a straggly ponytail. I'm not going to beat around the bush and do all that what have you learned over the summer rubbish. I'll leave that to your teachers, eh? She gave us a wink and got a few sniggers back from the audience. Mrs Zimmerman closed her eyes. What I am going to do, the mayor went on, is tell you we've heard reports of wanderers five miles south of the town boundary. Wanderers? The sniggering stopped. Mrs Zimmerman opened her eyes. A shiver crept across my shoulders. Yep, Mayor Anderson nodded. Yesterday I was up at the city, met with some colleagues. It's been a while since we had wanderers in our area, but their numbers appear to be increasing. She took a slow moment to look from one side of the hall to the other, catching as many of our eyes as she could. So, she carried on. Why do we not want wanderers nearby? Anyone? Trigg stuck his arm up high as he could get it, pushed it even higher with the other hand. Mayor Anderson couldn't miss him. Go on then, tell us, Trigg. There, uh Trigg looked up to the ceiling, the way you do when you try to, hard to remember something. Dirty, dangerous and deceitful. Dirty. Dangerous, deceitful. Mayor Anderson boomed the words back at us, counting them off on her fingers. And to think, she said, that they're supposed to be on our side in this war. She clasped her hands behind her and swayed backwards and forwards with her feet stopped still. Our country is one of a few places, perhaps even the only place, that has kept the enemy at bay. Why is that, do you think? Trigg stuck his hand up again. Our geography has helped for sure, Mayor Anderson nodded at Trigg like he'd given her the answer even though he hadn't. Along with our land's wonderful capacity for self-sufficiency, she nodded some more, but the real reason our country survives is us, our very selves. She held her arms wide. We are an adaptable people, stoic, brave. We understand the importance of hard work and sacrifice for a greater good. We have a long history of wartime resilience. It's in our blood, and the bravest of us all, of course, are our eldest's. She looked at Jed and Lindy. They nudged shoulders again. At camp, said Mayor Anderson, our eldest join the quiet war. They fight valiantly. They fight heroically. They fight so that we, back home, can remain safe. My one and only child, Caroline, went to camp ten years ago this very month. I couldn't be more proud. We clapped for Caroline. The mayor held up a hand. But, she said, the wanderers do not send their eldest to camp. She did a slow shake of her head. They are protected from the enemy by our brave heroes, but they selfishly keep their own eldests close. They disobey Andrew Salisbury's edict that decrees we must all send our eldest to camp. They deny their families the opportunity to live in a town in a civilised manner, and they deny their eldest the opportunity to fight for their country. They are dirty, dangerous and deceitful. Do we want their kind anywhere near us, here in Fenniswick? No, Mayor Anderson. We shook our heads. And more than that, 
The mayor leaned in towards us and lowered her voice to a whisper. Much more than that. You're aware of the horror wreaked by the wanderers the last time they ventured close to Fenniswick. My own sister was among the casualties. She dropped her eyes to the floor. A litter list at the front began to cry. Trigg's knees started jiggling. So, the mayor took a deep breath and lifted her head. What can we do to keep ourselves safe? What's the most important rule of all? Never go beyond the boundary, Trigg burst out the answer. Absent, blooming lootly, Trigg Cruz. Never go beyond the boundary. Follow that rule and you'll be safe from wanderers. Remember, dirty, dangerous, deceitful. All right? Yes, Mayor Anderson. We nodded. She smiled. One of those smiles where the sides of your mouth go down instead of up. So how about we sing the boundary song to finish? Mayor Anderson rubbed her hands together. Mr Temple, would you accompany us on the old piano? Still working, is it? Mr Temple lifted the lid of the piano. He interlaced his fingers and turned them inside out. The clicking echoed all around the hall. Oh, a quick reminder before we start singing. Mayor Anderson wasn't smiling anymore. She ran her tongue across the front of her teeth. Going beyond a town boundary isn't only a risk to yourself. It puts the whole of Fenniswick in danger. Your friends, your family, your neighbours. And anyone who puts Fenniswick in danger could be subject to a very serious punishment indeed. So let's keep safe, eh? Now, carry on, Mr Temple. The crying littlest cried even louder. Back in the classroom, Miss Conte talked about the time before the quiet war and the summer holidays were like then. She said people used to go to other countries on aeroplanes. I doodled a picture of an aeroplane in the bottom corner of my slate, licked my finger and rubbed it off. Sometimes I wondered if teachers didn't make, just make stuff up. After break, Miss Conte asked for our summer diaries. She walked between the desks, collecting them and in and piling them up in her arms. I'll be reading through these this afternoon, she said, and tomorrow I'll announce the winners. I passed her mine, taking care to keep the bow straight. Thank you, Maddie. Maddie? Lindy laughed. It's Maggie, Miss Conte, not Maddie. Oh, of course it is. Sorry, Maggie. The baby had me up four times last night. She put my diary on the pile, then stuck six more right on top of it, squashing the bow. Okay, everyone. So that was chapter one of The Middler. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed reading it. The time that I read it is the first time that I read it with you. So I don't know what's going to happen before you do. So the task I'm going to set you from chapter one, please, is I've got a few questions that I want to know based on the first chapter. Could you have a go, please, at writing down five questions that you want to know the answer to based on the book? Your first one could be, what is the quiet war? Is it a real war? How long has it been going on for? Thank you for tuning in. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.